Um, if you are new to Deerfield Community Church, I want you to know that we are an open and affirming congregation, and no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. There are two cards uh, in your pews, and one is a welcome card. If you'd like to fill it out and tell us who you are and things that you like to do that you might want to do here at this church. And the other is a prayer request, and either of those cards you can put into the offering plate when uh, it goes around. I have uh, some announcements from Lynn Garland. Uh, she'd like us all to take a moment to fill out a card to our Horton Center pen pal, um, Hannah Crosby. And there are no cards and postcards that are in the back of the great room that you can use. We've already received four cards from Hannah, so she'd love it if we wrote her a card. Um, the other thing she wants, would like, if you have time to brighten, uh, this is a little manipulative, but if you have time to brighten the day of a Ukrainian child or refugee, no, um, next Friday in the great room, anytime between 9.30 and 2.30, they're going to tie blankets. No worries if you haven't made one before, as there are lots of experienced people there to help you, help teach you how. And thank you to everyone who came to the blood drive on Thursday and to our bakers of delicious finger foods. We had 20 people who came to donate, who came to donate blood to help potentially save a life. Bonnie, do we have any figures on how many pints we collected? It's about, it's, yeah, I mean, it's roughly 20. <laughs> and that's it. Um, let us welcome the light of Christ into our hearts, into our minds, and into this church. Good morning. Please join me in this morning's unison affirmation of belonging. I am an equally precious and worthy child of God. I am a beloved child of God in whom God is well pleased. I am a child of God created in love and worthiness. I am seen, I am heard, and I am valued just as I am. I am diverse, and my gifts are unique, and God celebrates me for who I am. I bring my whole self to God, my joys, my struggles, my hopes, and my dreams. I am welcomed. I am cherished without condition. I belong. I am connected to each person here and to all of creation, in unison with God. I find strength and purpose. Please stand as you are able and join me in singing God of grace and God of glory.
you remain standing and join me in this morning's responsive call to worship. We gather today to embrace our imperfections, knowing that they are not marks of weakness, but pathways to courage and wholehearted living. We come acknowledging our flaws and insecurities, seeking the strength to dare greatly in our lives. As Paul reminds us in 2 Corinthians, we rejoice in our weaknesses, for it is through them that Christ's power is made perfect. We trust that God's grace is sufficient for us, and in our frailties, we find God's strength. We come to discover the depth of God's love and the boundless strength of God's presence. Together, let us pray for the courage to be imperfect and to rely on God's unfailing grace. Amen. Please be seated. We now come to the time in our worship service when we give ourselves an opportunity to reach out to one another with our prayers of concern and celebration, those things we wish to raise up to God amidst God's people. I have a few this morning, uh, and then we'll open it up for others here in the sanctuary and on Zoom uh, who also may wish to raise up prayers. First, Carol Hutchinson. Good morning, Carol. Carol is joining us this morning. She requests prayers of comfort and healing following a fall she had this past week, uh, injuring her nose and her knee. Carol, I hope you're doing okay. What's the update? The update is I'm doing well. You're doing well. Good, good. Thank you good. for all good the to see, Good to see parents. you home. Good to see you home. Uh, Leslie Raymond requests prayers of peace and acceptance for her husband, Dale, whose mother is transitioning to a permanent nursing home this month. So please keep uh, Dale and his mother and the extended family in your prayers. Update on Evelyn Dakota. Evelyn also joins us this morning. It's good to see Evelyn. She is continuing to recover at her daughter's house in Massachusetts and will return home as soon as she is, feels comfortable doing so. Anything further you'd like to add, Evelyn? Prayers of gratitude for this amazing community. Thank you all. You're welcome. God bless you. Good to see you. Good to be here. Jackie Nyberg requests prayers of healing and comfort for a friend that had a serious fall and is awaiting surgery. Um, surgery apparently cannot happen right now because of other health issues. Uh, prayers also for his wife, as this is a difficult time for her as well. So please keep um, this friend and um, his wife in your prayers. Those are the prayers of concern and celebration I have. Are there others this morning? Good morning. I have three continued prayers for my sister's grandson, William. The medication seems to be working, at least somewhat. Prayers for my daughter, Beth, who will be having back surgery tomorrow. Pray that all goes well and she has a full and speedy recovery. And prayers for Sue Lassen's grandson, Liam, who was injured with a bad ankle sprain during a basketball game. Mm. Thank you, Sue. Uh, not Sue, Carol. <laughs> Um, I want to thank everybody for the backing up of all the stuff that we're, when I can't get here, somebody else takes it when I ask them to do it. Um, I also am very happy with the new weather that we have right now. <laughs> and we're about halfway done with our fields. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Marie. Marion? Speak loudly and I'll repeat it. All right, thank you. Thank you, Tim. Prayers of joy to be here this Sunday. I'm home for my grandson's weekend birthday softball uh, little league and having a great time coming home for his special day. He yeah. turned 10 yesterday. Mm. His name is Gavin. Gavin. 
I just wanted to say yesterday we went to the garden walk, the garden tour. It was absolutely beautiful. We have some very talented people in this town mm. and very gracious hosts. So thank you all for what you do. Thank you, Robin. Uh, prayers for the future of our country. Yes. Uh, a prayer of that. This is Jim. I have a prayer of gratitude uh, that I was able to have sort of a, a mini family reunion yesterday with my two sisters and two of my children over in Lee, Massachusetts. We had a wonderful day, and uh, it's very important to get together once in a while mm -hmm. and go over old times and new times. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Dee. Uh, just very glad to be home from Georgia before the snafu with the computers. <laughs> yes, yes. You and me both. You flew in yesterday? So I flew, I flew in yesterday and I was like, well, I'm glad it's not Friday. Uh. Yes, Helen. I'd like prayers from my grandson, Grayson, and my daughter, Ashley. Yeah. And Papa. And Papa. I'd like to offer a prayer of celebration for my good friends, the Kalapinskis, who, um, da, 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 um, who celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary yesterday. Wow. Thank you, Tim. Any prayers this morning on Zoom? It's good to see you all. No prayers I see on Zoom. Oh, Sandy, yes. Good morning. Good morning. I was going to say, uh, we come here for hope. And last week's, you know, the week before's sermon, Always remember that Jesus loves us, no matter what. Yes. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Sandy. Seeing and hearing no other prayer requests, let's pray together. boundless and compassionate God. We gather in your presence today, embracing our vulnerabilities and flaws, trusting in your boundless grace to shepherd us. We acknowledge our frailties, knowing that in our weakness, your omnipotence is revealed. As we dare greatly in our lives, may your love and power fortify our spirits. In this sacred moment of reflection and supplication, we lift up those who are suffering due to various national and international events. We pray for the victims of natural calamities who have lost their homes and loved ones, seeking your solace and provision in their name of dire time of dire need. We remember those affected by conflicts and violence yearning for tranquility and justice to prevail in their lands. For the marginalized and oppressed who face injustice and discrimination daily, we ask your protection and the courage to continue their quest for equality. We pray for those enduring economic hardship who struggle to make ends meet, that they may find hope and sustenance in their communities. In the midst of global health crises, we lift up the ill and the healthcare workers tirelessly caring for them. Grant them fortitude, endurance, and healing. As we navigate our own imperfections and vulnerabilities, may we extend grace to ourselves and others. 
recognizing that our shared humanity is the foundation of our strength. Help us to live authentically and with compassion, reaching out to those in need with open hearts and hands. We dedicate our lives to your service, trusting that your love will transform our weaknesses into sources of strength and courage. May we be instruments of your peace and agents of your justice in the world. In the name of Jesus Christ, who embraces our imperfections and empowers us to live boldly, and who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. recognizing that we live in a world of imperfections. God gives us all sorts of opportunities to help. Not to fix imperfections, but to help those imperfections be heard and seen and felt and cared for. We do that in lots of ways. We do that through prayer, we do that through song, we do that through word. And we can also do that in our time of offering. This is an opportunity for us to lend a helping hand to those who do not feel seen, heard, or felt. This morning's offering will now begin.
Let's pray together. Gracious God, we dedicate these gifts and ourselves to the transformative journey of embracing our imperfections, trusting in your boundless grace to fortify us, empower us to live authentically and wholeheartedly, that in our weakness, your love and power may be magnified. Amen. Please be seated. With all those who are interested in coming forward for the children's message and the message for all ages, please do so now. Good morning. Good to see you all. So, um, have you all seen the show before, America's Funniest Videos? Everybody probably knows about it, or most of us, right? And it's pretty funny, right? There's some things on there that are, they're kind of bloopers, right? They're kind of funny. It's not your favorite show. Marie's not sold on this show. I love this show. We used to watch it at our house a lot. And it's still on. This is a show that keeps going. People love to see other people's funny mistakes. Like, it's kind of funny, right? People might trip or do something silly, or um, something else that people think is funny is if they see bloopers from TV shows, like the actors have made a mistake and they say the wrong word, and they laugh because they're, they're having a good time and it's kind of silly. The other day a video came across my, uh, came to my attention of Sesame Street bloopers, which are a thing I didn't even know. Yeah, Sesame Street bloopers, look it up. So. Um, but it's kind of funny. They're, they're making these mistakes and they're able to kind of chuckle about it, right? Um, but some mistakes might not seem so funny, right? So um, those, uh, those things that might happen, maybe you um, have dropped something and broken something of somebody else's, right? That's not really a blooper to laugh about because you might feel bad. The other day, <clears throat> I came home and... Um, Ash and I like to go paint pottery, and I had came home, and one of the pieces I had recently painted was in about 15 pieces on the counter. And uh, so I walk in and I immediately see it, and Ash is standing in the kitchen like this, and I knew it was a mistake, right? And so I was like, oh, gosh, what happened to my bowl? And um, Ash was like, I'm, I'm really sorry. I was emptying the dishwasher, and I dropped it. And so I said, oh, it's okay, I'll paint another. And I wasn't really upset because I can paint another. And um, it really was okay. I've dropped in broken stuff before too. And so um, I kind of teased and I said, oh, okay, well, where's your ghost mug, which is the one Ash most recently painted. Like joking, I was gonna drop theirs too, but I would not, of course. So I was fine. Ash made this mistake, dropped the bowl that it was really, that I had made. And I was like, all right, I'll paint another one, right? Ash apologized many more times because I was okay with the mistake that had been made, but Ash was feeling terribly about the mistake that, that had been made. I wasn't mad. Other people might make mistakes and we are easy to forgive other people. Sometimes it's a little hard, but usually we can kind of forgive other people for the mistakes that they've made. What's harder, I think, is forgiving ourselves for mistakes that we have made. Do you think that sometimes? Sometimes we're kind of hard on ourselves for mistakes we've made. I was not mad about the bowl. Ash was upset about the bowl. Because it's hard sometimes to say to ourselves, we make mistakes. Sometimes we say the wrong thing. Sometimes we do the wrong thing. Sometimes we break something. Sometimes we hurt somebody's feelings. Sometimes we just make mistakes and that's Fine. I would like everybody to just be as kind to yourselves about your mistakes as you are to other people who make mistakes. Because I was ready to hug Ash and go be, move on with my life. It was Ash who was having a hard time with that mistake. So I would love for you all to say, we all make mistakes and it is okay and I love myself and people love me and God loves me and I'm gonna fix this mistake 
as well as I can. And then I'm going to make another mistake and fix it, and another mistake and fix it, and hopefully learn from those mistakes as you go, right? We don't, maybe if I came home today to another broken bowl, I would be like, okay, well, now let's fix, the, let's fix this mistake, right? But you can do that too. You can say to yourself, I made a mistake, and I can fix it, and I can do better. Just love yourselves through that. All right, let's be in prayer. God, we know that you love us even through all our mistakes. And we love others even through all their mistakes. God, please help us be strong enough to love ourselves even through our own mistakes. Amen. Okay, you can return. Let's pray together. Gracious and loving God, remind us that you love us for our imperfections, not in spite of them. Amen. This morning's scripture lesson comes from the second letter to the people of Corinth, Paul's second letter to the people of Corinth. It seems that they were having, um, well, they were struggling to recognize that the mistakes that they were perceiving they were making, that the weaknesses they perceived that they had were somehow made them less faithful. So Paul writes them a letter and includes in that letter these words. On my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. But if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think better of me than what is seen in me or heard from me, even considering the exceptional character of the revelations. Therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Beloved, today we gather in this sacred space to explore a profound and liberating truth. Our imperfections and weaknesses are not marks of shame, but pathways to discovering the depth of God's grace and the fullness of our humanity. In Paul's second letter to the Corinthians that I just read, Paul navigates the delicate balance between boasting and humility. On the surface, it might be said that Paul was the very first person to make widely known the idea of the humble brag. Has anybody ever heard of humble brag? Some of you have. All right. This term may help us understand Paul's rhetoric, rhetorical strategy in this passage. A humble brag is defined as a seemingly modest or humble statement whose actual purpose is to draw attention to something of which one is proud. Here's an example. I'm honored to have been chosen as the keynote speaker of this year's Nobel Peace Prize winners, though I still can't believe they picked me out of so many qualified candidates. It kind of makes you go, ew, right? Like, okay, that's a humble brag. I'm sure some of you have heard him. I'm sure all of us have entertained them. I know sometimes I have words come out of my mouth and I go, geez, that didn't sound very humble. 
Paul starts by emphasizing that he won't boast about his own accomplishments, but will boast about his weaknesses. He writes, I will not boast except of my weaknesses. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. Paul is addressing a situation where some in the Corinthian church are questioning his apostolic authority. Who is this guy? Often comparing him to other so-called super apostles who might be boasting about their spiritual experiences and credentials. Does he have the receipts? Paul, however, chooses to flip the script Instead of boasting about his strengths and accomplishments, he highlights the weaknesses and the suffering. And by doing so, Paul underscores a fundamental Christian paradox that God's power is made perfect in human weakness. Let me say that again. God's power is made perfect in human weakness. This isn't a boast in the traditional sense, but rather a way to point to the sufficiency of God's grace and the strength that comes from Christ. So while humble brag typically implies a subtle or backhanded way of boasting, Paul's intent is quite different. He's not trying to boast about his humility, but to redirect, to draw attention away from himself, to redirect attention away from himself and toward God's power and grace. He wants the Corinthians to understand that true strength comes from reliance on God, not from human achievements or credentials. In this context, Paul's message is profoundly countercultural, both in his time and in ours. It challenges, it challenges us to reconsider our notions of strength, success, and worthiness, urging us to find our identity and strength in God's grace, even and especially in our own weaknesses. Brene Brown, in her book, Daring Greatly, speaks to this very struggle. She writes, Vulnerability sounds like truth and feels like courage. Truth and courage aren't always comfortable, but they are never weaknesses. Brown's research into shame and vulnerability offers us a modern lens through which we can understand Paul's ancient wisdom. She helps us to see that embracing our imperfections is an act of courage and a step toward wholeness, toward wholehearted living. In our weaknesses, we find a profound connection to one another and to God. When we acknowledge our struggles and our need for help, we open ourselves to the transformative power of community and the healing grace of God. It is in these moments of honesty and vulnerability that we experience the depth of God's love and the strength of our collective spirit. This past week, I attended a conference in Columbus, Ohio, the booming metropolis of Columbus, Ohio. It was the 20th uh, convention for a group called Prune Belly Syndrome, the Prune Belly Syndrome Network. Prune belly syndrome is something that I was born with. And I, like many of us who are around my age in our 50s and 60s and some in our 40s, some in our 30s, we were, our parents were all told, truthfully, we were the very first person to, to survive this disease. That there was nobody else on the face of the planet that had actually lived past the age of two with prune belly syndrome. Well, our parents, just hanging on to hope, drank that Kool-Aid, right? And they were very happy to do so. But when we became old enough to move from kind of concrete thinking to abstract thought, we, including myself, started to think to ourselves, 
How is it possible that in a world of now 8 billion people, I think at the time it was 7 billion, 8 billion people, can I be the only human being that has ever lived past the age of two with prune belly syndrome? I don't think I am that special. So I remember the days when we had to spend like 12, 12 not 12,000, well, you could have spent 12,000, but 1,200 or $2,500 on your first computer at home, right? I don't know if you did, but I was in the IT industry, so I did. And I bought this computer and I brought it home and it was our first kind of big computer and get on the internet. And we were trying to get pregnant at the time. And I remember thinking, I was around 33. And I remember thinking to myself, still at 33, I don't know anybody else with prune belly syndrome. Is it possible that I am like the only person that has prune belly syndrome? It is a very rare disease. So I went online, and this is before Google, so don't ask me how I was searching. But I'm like, okay, prune belly syndrome. And I hit enter. And the very first thing that pops up is the prune belly syndrome network. And I'm like, holy smokes. Not, am I, not only am I not the only human being that has ever had this, this disease and lived past the age of two, there apparently is another group of human beings that have actually found each other and are talking to each other about this disease. It freaked me out. I couldn't handle it. So for a minute, more than a minute, six months, I stayed away. I was like, this can't be, this has to be some sort of hoax. This is not real. Remember chat rooms before social media and all that stuff with these little folders on the side, right? And there was this one folder that said, new people, introductions. So six months go by and I click on it and I'm like, hi, I'm Kurt Walker. I have PBS. And people responded, it was crazy. It was like suddenly I had community and I heard their stories. And I heard about their childhood and their birth stories and their parents and what their parents were told. And we, ha and we immediately had something in common. I had something in common with people I had never met before whose faces, because this was pre-pictures, whose I could only see names, but whose faces I didn't even know. No, I didn't even know where they lived. And we connected. One thing led to another. And at the age of 36, I met the first, I physically in person met another person with prune belly syndrome. And around the same time, a year later, 20 years ago, this week, as a matter of fact, we had our first convention. And it was small. There were like 40 of us in this group. And we were all based in the United States. Some of us were in New England. Some of us were in the Midwest. A couple of people in Texas. I think one or two people on the West Coast. And we got together in New York City, suburb of New York City. And we got together just to see each other and to be with one another and to be like, oh, you too. Your imperfections and my imperfections, they're the same. I'm not alone. I have community. You jump forward 20 years, and we now have over 10,000 members on five continents. And when we have these conventions, we have them once a year, we have a team of researchers, Dr. Linda Baker, shout out to her. She has 25 researchers and clinical physicians who's, who, who through NIH grants, they get a lot of money from the government and other places, are actually studying and researching prune belly syndrome, which none of you had, well, some of you had heard about it from me, but most of you probably had never heard of, right? 20 years, we still have so far to go but where, how, what distance we have come in 20 years. And how did that happen? Again, through imperfections. So, that is just a story about how a beloved community of people, of individuals who feel alone and who feel shame and who feel neglect in their imperfections and guilt in their imperfections come together and realize 
that it is in our imperfections and in our weaknesses that we have strength. And we gain that strength not just from one another, but from God as well. As a community of faith, we are called to create a space where all can feel safe to share our true selves, imperfections and all. This is what it means to be an open and affirming church. We affirm that every person, regardless of their background, their identity, or their life circumstances, is beloved by God and an integral part of our community. When we embrace our imperfections, we also embrace our shared humanity. We recognize that each of us carries burdens and struggles, and it is through our shared experiences that we find strength. Paul's testimony of finding power and weakness resonates deeply with this understanding. He reminds us <clears throat> that it is not in our self-sufficiency, our self-conceived notions of perfection, but in our dependence on God and on one another, and especially on God in those times when we humans fail each other. That is when we find true strength in God's grace and mercy. Think about this for a second. Take a moment to think about this for a second. What times in your lives when is it that you have felt most connected to other people? Were these moments of triumph and perfection, of, hey, look at me? Or were they moments when you were able to be vulnerable and honest about your struggles? Is it often, it is often in the latter that we find genuine connection and support. It is in our shared humanity that we discover the presence of God. And this is one of the reasons why we pray a pastoral prayer each week. Sometimes folks, I think, hopefully, half-heartedly are joking with me, gosh, your pastoral prayers are very long, Pastor Kurt. There's a reason for that. These pastoral prayers allow us the opportunity to connect with others, both those whom we know and those whom we may never know around the world, whose faces we may never see, who names, whose names we may never know in our common imperfections and struggles. Pastoral prayers are not just an opportunity for us to pray for others, it is also an opportunity for us to connect with God and ourselves by acknowledging our own feelings of helplessness and grief and struggles and losses, trusting that God hears our cries that we connect with the cries of humanity on a global scale, and that God holds everything and everyone in divine compassion. In the words of Brene Brown, owning our story can be hard, but not nearly as difficult, and I will say sharing our story can be hard, <clears throat> but it is not nearly as difficult as spending our entire lives running from that story or trying to hide that story or bottling that story up inside ourselves until it explodes in either rage or mental health issues that cause us to be hospitalized. Embracing our vulnerabilities is risky, but it is not nearly as dangerous as giving up on love and, and belonging and joy. Let us dare greatly as individuals and as a community to embrace our imperfections and to find strength in our shared vulnerabilities. May we be a congregation that lives out this truth, creating a space where all can feel safe 
and loved and affirmed. And may we find in our weaknesses the perfect power of Christ dwelling in us, guiding us and transforming us into agents of God's healing and justice in the world. Amen. Please stand as you are able and join me in singing Amazing Grace. Please join me in the unison prayer of lament and healing. Merciful God, I come before you with a heart burdened by sorrow and a spirit weighed down by grief. I lament the pain and suffering in our world, the injustices that persist, and the brokenness that touches my life and the lives of those I love. In my anguish, I cry out to you, seeking your comfort and peace. I mourn for those who have lost their homes and loved ones to natural disasters. I grieve for those who suffer from violence and war. God of compassion, hear my cries and hold me in your tender embrace. In my brokenness, may I find your strength. In my despair, may I find your hope. Transform my grief into action, my sorrow into solidarity, and my tears into a source of renewal. Empower me to be an instrument of your healing and an agent of your justice, that I may work with others to bring about a world where peace and love prevail. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. <laughs> 